Hello, and welcome to Public Key, the podcast from Chainalysis. This is your host, Ian Andrews. In case you didn't know, my day job is not hosting this podcast. I'm actually Chief Marketing Officer for Chainalysis. So I've been closely watching the emerging space of Web3 marketing. Web2 marketing has been built around email, browser cookies, and CRM systems like HubSpot. But when your users are anonymous and the mode of interaction might start and end with a crypto wallet, collecting emails and phone numbers just seems a little outdated. So what does it look like to reimagine marketing tech that utilizes on-chain data? In this episode, I look to answer this question and more by sitting down with the co-founders of Absolute Labs, Samir Adamine, who's the CEO, and Anthony Gardez, the Chief Product and Technical Officer. They've invented a new term, wallet relationship management, and are trying to rewire marketing in Web3 for big brands like LVMH and Samsung, who are looking to onboard the next generation of digital native customers. This week, we take a break from the crypto crime topic, but if you're missing your fix, not to worry. The 2023 Crypto Crime Report is now available. See the show notes for the download link. And if you'd like to meet the team behind the report live and in person, then you're going to need to join me next week, April 4th and 5th in New York City for the Chainalysis Links Conference. Get your ticket if you're lucky enough to find one before the event sells out. Today I have an exciting company called Absolute Labs. Their founders, Samir Adamine and Anthony Gardez, are joining me on the podcast today. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Samir, I was looking at the Absolute Labs website over the weekend, getting ready for the podcast, and right at the top is a term that I've not encountered anywhere else in in Web3, but it piqued my interest, and that's wallet relationship management. Can we start there? What is wallet relationship management, and why does anyone need it? Sure. Wallet relationship management. So in the Web2 world, we talk about CRM and marketing automation. In the Web3 world, wallet is the gateway you know, to connect with a customer, right? And they are anonymized. They're using a wallet. That's the only way. So rather than saying something around CRM for Web3, we came with this. We even registered it, by the way. But we came with this wallet relationship management approach that is describing the full marketing platform for Web3, but includes CRM features, segmentation features, analytics, as you know, you know, Web3 on-chain analytics data is available to anyone. It's not structured, but, you know, we structured it in a way that marketing people can leverage it, actually. So it covers everything from analytics, segmentation, CRM, and marketing automation. We believe it's the next marketing. Amazing, because I, I've been thinking about this a lot since getting into crypto, which is like you started out the point there, the wallet is now the center of the universe. It's not an email address. It's not a cookie that I can drop in someone's browser. It's not a mobile device ID, right? Those are all the things that we've anchored our concept of customers around and have powered the last generation of marketing. It really is this on-chain identity. And what I think is powerful about thinking about wallet as your first order relationship data point is there's so much information, right? Metadata that is collectible. So I'm really excited to dig into what Absolute is building. I think I think it could be one of the most exciting things to come out of crypto here in 2023. But before we go there, talk a little bit about the company and your, your relationship with Anthony. This is not the first company that you all have started. Go back in time a little bit and talk about what you've been up to before Absolute. Sure. So it's our third company together. We did two companies before. We've been working together for the past 15 years, I believe. Anthony will tell you the story, but he went out of school, was looking for an internship, and he became uh, probably my best hire in all my career at this time. So, and since then, you know, we've been working together. So we are marketing tech entrepreneurs, right? That's our expertise. We came late to Web3 and crypto, exceeded our previous company way two years ago. We spent some time discovering Web3, the blockchain, testing everything, trading on a daily basis at the best time, by the way, for that, which means that probably, you know, beginning of 2021 and 2020, beginning 2021. But we then realized, as you just said, right, that wallets is the center for, and it's probably going to replace or complete the email in the coming years in the way we connect with services online. So realizing how powerful it could be, we decided that this industry needs a marketing platform that is a wallet-first marketing platform, right? Not just leveraging the email or the mobile phone, 
but really the wallet. So we looked at the market. We talked with dozens of Web3 companies. We realized nothing existed there. Everyone was talking about community management, communities, right? On Discord and this type of you know community management. But no one was really talking about marketing. And we got very fortunate that in some way we de- we we decided to stop trading and getting get serious again in June 2021 starting building our product. We incorporated our company in December 2021 and launched our product in July 2022. It took us almost 12 months actually to build you know, the platform with Anthony and the team. We've onboarded almost 40 companies so far, Web2 and Web3. And so we have history with Anthony, but again, you know, we are marketing tech entrepreneurs first and we just apply you know, to Web3 what, we've, what we learned in the past 15 years, right? That's exciting. Anthony, when was the first time you encountered crypto and- and if you're comfortable sharing, what what were you and Samir trading before you yeah. started Absolute? So I'm, I'm one of these guys who had a lot of friends saying, hey, I just bought some Bitcoin. I just bought some Ethereum. And I was always saying, well, it's probably too late. It was too late until I bought some, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it probably, yeah. I don't know, I probably started hearing about it eight years ago. I only got in, as in just like Samir, end of 2020. And so to me, the, the journey was actually starting with stocks then options because it sounded more profitable in a way and then i saw crypto first the main one the blue chips so trading some ethereum some cardano some bitcoin and then diving more into the decentralized side of things and the meme coins and all the the good and the bad from there from the innovation and scams to just being a part of it all and also investing my time in, in, in communities, also working on the technical side of things. I have both a technical background of a software engineer and a product background. And so it was very interesting to me to see a space in which there's a lot of innovation that is incentivized, which is quite rare. Open source innovation where people actually make money to do better code, that's quite new. And I think I found it very interesting and seeing all the innovation on different aspects from the top companies raising a lot of capital to the meme coin space, which itself is quite innovative as well, right? There's a lot of things happening in the fully decentralized, fully degen side of crypto. And I found that very interesting. So I started looking into tokens, into staking, into all of these aspects from a technical standpoint building contracts and so on and then looking into nfts and then yeah at some point we we realized that there was a gap in terms of pooling for companies getting in and our past company was around mobile marketing automation and we saw the beginning of companies diving into mobile apps and trying out different strategies and building apps which most times were not so exciting, but which were ways for them to try out this new world, this new technology. And and we really saw the same thing in Web3 and we're right in the middle of it. Maybe, you know, at the end of this first phase of exploration for brands, but it's clear that there's been experiments, there's been fails, there's been successes. And, uh, and now we... These companies, they want to find tools they can use to, to measure their performance, to optimize their re- return on investment. And that's really what we're building. You bring up a really interesting point about this direct financial incentive playing such a big role in communities. But I I think about how most companies who have a consumer-focused market today, like coupons, are almost always their most direct. Like I have an email inbox full of offers and promotions from people I bought things in the past that are trying to get me to come back as a repeat customer, right? 50% off or buy this and get this other thing that we're giving you away for free. And so in some ways, I think you could say, well, maybe crypto has taken it a step too far. You don't want the financialization of everything. But in other ways, it seems like it's a much more direct approach. There's less indirection or misleading the end user about what you're getting. It's like, no, you're going to be able to potentially make some money by participating. And then that's going to be a net good for all community participants over time. I, I don't know if either of you have a have an opinion on that statement. Sure. What you just said reminds me also of the initial impact of reviews on apps, because we're comparing this to mobile apps and companies got immediate feedback on what they were building. In the past, they would create websites and just think the websites were good, right? And there was a bit of feedback through, I don't know, promoter scores and service. But they had to yeah, like I, I look at traffic volumes. I look at bounce rates, like time on page as like indirect measures of is it good or bad? They, yeah, exactly. People might come because they don't have a choice. You know, they want yeah. to buy your products. Your website is very bad, but they have to come. <laughs> and they, are, they have no way to express that your website is probably very bad in terms of user experience. So they got yeah. reviews on mobile apps, which allowed to get a feedback. Then social networks also helped in that. 
Here, it's even more direct in some areas around, for instance, digital collectibles and digital assets, because you get the immediate feedback in the fluctuations of floor prices and the prices of assets. And it's transparent. It's public data, right? What is amazing here, I mean, it's a dream for a marketing executive, right? In any company today, you know their behavior, you know what they like, all of these things, right? Because they agree to share it. It's public. I think a lot of people actually miss that point when they first get into crypto. So I'm glad you brought it up is that every action you take on chain is by definition public. It may not be attributed to your full real world identity, but the activity is accessible for everyone to see, which is an important distinction. Our CEO actually described this to me recently is the difference between anonymity and privacy. Yes, right. Exactly. Like there's very few systems that guarantee true anonymity, but there's lots of systems that reflect on privacy. We'll loop back to this privacy topic maybe in, in a little bit, but Anthony, I'm curious as a marketer myself, right? I, I run the, the marketing organization here at Chainalysis. So I spend a lot of time thinking about marketing technology. You know, we have a very classic stack of, uh, you know, Salesforce and Marketo and Sixth Sense and a bunch of other tools that allow us to collect and analyze data. And then our operationalize you know, marketing programs and campaigns. When you look at the Web3 landscape and the evolution of that kind of classic Web2, if you will, MarTech stack, like where do you see the big gaps and problems? And then what are some of the ones that Absolute is focused on solving today and, and in the near term? I think there's two main answers to your question. There, there's many answers. The first one is there is a breadth of data that is available that you should leverage as a marketer. So if you have a Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever other CRM, you are stuck with the contacts you acquire by marketing efforts. If you are in Web3, you have 420 million addresses out there on the blockchain, and that is just Ethereum and Polygon, for which you know everything. So you have leads you can start qualifying from the get-go. So that would be one thing of having data you can start looking into. The other aspect is, well, your own customers, your own existing users, where collecting data, which is basically one, one of the key primary things companies do, any retailer wants to know more and more about you so they can be more relevant, so they can target you, retarget you and show you the relevant products and get you to buy more. The big aspect of what Web3 is, is in a realm that does not exist for Salesforce and HubSpot and other CRMs. They're, they have no way of looking into and storing on-chain activity. And so they're not ready to, to give you the context of the interests, the, the holdings, the past holdings, a view on your competitors as well, and everything else that comes from blockchain activity. So that would be the main two things you're missing out if you use a traditional marketing stack. There's many more around also the ability to, you mentioned Marketo, which is a marketing automation platform. HubSpot does that and many others as well. There's also the ability to react to triggers coming from Web3. Since again, this is an open data world, you can see people buying and selling. You can react in real time to people acquiring your assets or other assets. You can react to a combination of what's happening in the blockchain and in your traditional CRM as well. So altogether, there there's, again, a breadth of use cases opening up. And if you stick to traditional, a traditional stack, you are limited. I think you should you should start using our product like we are, by the way, lever leveraging yours. Anthony just described exactly what's going on, why Web3 is not a channel for Web2, right? Our previous company, we built a mobile platform, right? It was an additional channel for Salesforce and the CRM of the world. We had Salesforce, Microsoft Dynamics, Adobe as partners. We were like integrating with their platforms, adding this channel, right? Web3 is different. There's three main use cases, acquisition, conversion, and retention here. And Anthony described use cases for each of them. These Web2 tools are obsolete. They can, you cannot use them. They are based on the idea that you need to know to have the email of the customer first. You need to have all this demographic data on each customers. And that's not the way it works in Web3. You know, people want to be able to stay anonymized, etc. And the gateway, again, the customer contact is the wallet, is not an email. Email is secondary here. SMS, phone number is secondary here. We also leverage it, but it's not the main uh, gateway to the customer. So it's very difficult for Web2 existing marketing products to transition to Web3 because they're not built for that. They're not designed for that.
Yeah, I think it's a really good point. Like when I think about most of the tooling that we use, it deals in first party data, right? We might augment it using something like Zoom data, for example. You know, if you filled out a form but didn't put in the state or country you reside in, we might be able to augment some record uh, that's already been created. And we get just a little bit of like third party buyer behavior intent data, certain tools like Bombora is kind of the industry standard of Web2 where I can see you know, Samir, you were searching for blockchain analysis tools and visited some competitor websites. Maybe you're worthwhile to outreach, but that's fairly limited. When you think about the world of Web3, if you're consuming all this blockchain transactional data, you can see everywhere a wallet's interacted with anything. Suddenly, it's such a view of a wallet you're interested in's behavior over the total universe or ecosystem. Very different mindset in terms of how you think about data collection. I was really impressed visiting your website, looking at the customers that you've lined up. I mean, it's some of the top brands that listeners of this podcast will recognize in Web3, from Metaverse, the Sandbox, to DYDX, a, a big DeFi platform, MoonPay. But you've also been working with some really impressive Web2 companies like LVMH, the home of Louis Vuitton, for anybody that's into to expensive hand luggage, or Pernod Ricard. Let's talk about how a company that is not quite a year old since uh, product launch has been able to land these leading players in the Web 2 and Web 3 space. Like, what's the strategy been there? We get a lot of founders who listen to the podcast, so I'm, I'm sure they're eagerly anticipating any tips that maybe they can use in their own businesses. Yes. I mean, there is two answers for that. One is... We launched the product when the market needed it the most. July 2022, <laughs> there was a crash there. And you know, when the market is crashing, when when an industry like this young, you know, crypto industry was like all these web free players were seeing, you know, their uh, tokens going down, their NFT going down, etc. What do you do, right? You do marketing. You get closer to your customers. So you need tools for that. And then most of them looked at, we need a CRM. We need a marketing automation. We need all this, right? What do we have in the market? And the reality is that there is nothing. Again, all these Web2 products don't connect with on-chain analytics data, don't connect with wallets, don't connect. So we came probably at the right time and probably the first, you know, wallet relationship management platform that was ready. So that's very fortunate to come at a time where the industry needed it the most, right? Second thing is we are a SaaS company, right? Our culture organization is structural like any software as a service company, which means that our go-to-market and sales is designed like many of these B2B software companies, and many of them are like inspiration for us, starting with Salesforce that used to be, you know, Benioff used to be an investor in my previous company, as well as Salesforce Ventures. And we learned a lot with these folks, right? So we are structured as a SaaS company. We have an ambition to dominate this category we call WRM. And I think we are on a good path to be able to do it. Launching July 2022, better version of the platform, having onboarded almost 40 companies, I believe we'll get to 100 by the end of this year, right? We are looking to probably have 30 to 40% market share in the most active companies operating in Web3. And as you mentioned, a lot of Web2 companies, we call them Web2 companies, the LVMH. These guys are, are not only customers, but they're also investors now. Right, because wow. they're very interested. They have a fund called Aglay Ventures that invested recently in the company. We have a lot of investors from Web3 and the Web2 world since we announced our fundraising and we have great collaboration with these companies. They are all, again, investing a lot. And I believe the next three, four years are going to be dominated by these Web2 companies. It's a really great point. I mean, we're seeing this in chain analysis business as well, where companies that if you had asked me a year ago, Ian, how should we go about winning a customer like Bang & Olufsen? or some of the brands you've talked about here, I would have said, you know, to be honest, that's not our target addressable market. Like we work with people who are in crypto that want to operate on chain. The world of brands, particularly B2C is, is not crypto, right? They're focused on other things. And I got that totally wrong, right? I, I completely missed a market cycle that was happening here. I'm curious to, on two points here. So one, Tell us more about the fundraising. I mean, congratulations, right? That's an exciting milestone in every company's history. Let's start there. And I want to hear your perspective too on the, you know, these web two companies, what's motivating them to come into the space? 
they are seeing an opportunity here with the NFTs, especially the NFTs. They're not that much investing in tokens, but NFT is an amazing tool for especially luxury brands, retail brands, consumer goods, right? To share some of their actually ownership to their to their customers here, you know, to create better relationship with them, right? Once you own an NFT of a brand, right? You own a part of this brand, right? It's much more than buying the product, right? It's a different type of relationship you're creating here. So NFT are, there is a web free culture here that is, you know, probably the first step here, right? For these brands. And they realize that this web free culture is here. It's accelerating. It's going to become mainstream probably in the coming, let's say two, three, four years from now, right? We're still very early, but they see the opportunity and they see as well, what is very interesting with web two companies is they understand marketing very well. As you said, they have a marketing stack already. They're using, you know, all these CRM and marketing marketing products. They know how to do marketing, but they're learning and starting to innovate in Web3. Web3 companies is quite the opposite, right? <laughs> they know Web3 very well, but they, they're just starting with building their marketing stack. These brands are investing for the next four or five years, right? They're not seeing, you know, the next six months. And they're seeing, you know, that they have probably, many of them, few thousand, if, near, if not few hundred thousand wallets in their WRM, but they know that they will have millions in the coming years. And they want to be ready for that. They want to bridge Web2 and Web3 data with their existing Web2 CRM and the WRM. They want to be able to connect with this new type of customers that are like stakeholders, hold, you know, investors, sometimes developers, minting, etc. They have different yeah. roles here. We had Christie's on the podcast. They kind of famously got into the world of NFTs when they sold the Beeple NFT for 69 million. And, you know, so they were kind of early, I think, to the wave of NFT popularity. But that auction, actually, I don't know that many people realize this, was conducted in a very traditional sense, right? The sale, it wasn't an on-chain transfer of, of the NFT. And so what they went to work on, though, after that moment, was actually building a full on-chain, using Ethereum, experience. And what I was surprised to learn in talking to that team was they saw it both as an opportunity to pull in a new audience, right? People who were digital art collectors, but maybe would have never considered an auction house like Christie's as being a place that would accept them. So kind of your traditional DeFi NFT degens, potentially, if I can use that term in the politest, friendliest sense. But also they saw their existing customer base opening up to this world of digital assets and getting really excited about it and wanting to be true and native in the community that you're describing, Samir. So it was a really interesting collision that kind of cross-generational boundaries and different different marketing segments. Before I forget, though, I don't want to bury the lead on your fundraising news. What can you share with us in terms of details? Who did you raise from? What did you raise? What are you going to do with it? I'm happy to share more here. So we raised $8 million. It's a seed round. It's a significant one, especially during these times. We, we got oversubscribed. I mean, we had a, we were very, again, we're very fortunate coming at a time where the industry need this type of product, right? So we got a lot of interest. We decided to focus with strategic investors first, but they're helping us accelerate go to market. So we have Sparkle, that is an Animoca farm. We have LVMH, as I mentioned. Uh, we have MoonPay is a great partner. We have Samsung, you know, Next Ventures, right, as well. All these type of companies and, and a few others, some crypto VCs very early came in saying, hey, we're interested in what you're doing because, you know, we believe that infrastructure and SaaS products are key for this industry to emerge. APVC is one of them. W3I is another one of them. You know, we have Plaza Capital, great people that have been, you know, helping us from the very beginning, by the way, sharing, you know, their portfolio, they're really introducing us to web free companies. But, you know, we see a lot of interest from, again, this web too. That's why we have many of them. And there is another uh, luxury brand that we cannot mention here, but they are also an investor in the company and helping us a lot here so it's a significant round the way we're going to use our uh, found is you know go to market acceleration dominating this market right again as i mentioned looking for potentially 100 top companies as customers by the end of this year building partnership with companies like yours we already integrated your product and it's helping some of our customers already. This is a key part of making this industry become mass market. You, you guys are going to be a part of it. Uh, we want to contribute to that. And one of the reasons we also 
working with the Samsung of the world or the Animoca of the world is because these companies have this unique opportunity, you know, to onboard millions, if not hundreds of millions of consumers to Web3. Super exciting. Congratulations on the round. I, I don't know how many people listening realize, but raising at this point in time is, is an outstanding feat. So it suggests to me that you're onto something amazing. And so maybe, Anthony, this is a great time to transition. Like, let's go a bit deeper into what the absolute product does. Like, I'm a marketer. Pitch me on why I would use the platform and like, what are the capabilities today? What am I going to see near term if we start talking roadmap? And as Samir mentioned, you know, we've got this integration between chain analysis and absolute, I, maybe if you can work in a little bit of an explanation how those two things are tying together. The product on the high level, as we mentioned before, is a CRM and a marketing automation platform for Web3. And the Web3 side of it all means that there is a lot of data you start from. There is essentially four main features. The first one is insights, which is market intelligence. You can dive into any asset on the blockchain, so any NFT collection, any token, and dive into its performance from a business standpoint. It's all about companies using the platform. It's not for traders. It's not for individuals. The purpose of the market intelligence section is to understand sentiment, health, performance, and audiences. So who is currently invested in a given asset? Who are the past investors maybe, and who revolves around this asset and, and diving into these audiences. This is a good segue to the second main feature, which is audiences and segmentation. Because whenever you look at an audience, the NFT collection holders, the token holders, or any custom segment you create, you look at this audience and you understand their interests, their other holdings, their habits of spending, their buying power. You can see your share of portfolio for any given profile in any given uh, segment. So all of this is really taking a business and marketing angle to studying the blockchain. And so the segmentation and the audiences section is really the second main topic where you're able to leverage all the data from the blockchain itself, so the 425 plus million addresses we index, combined with your own data, which you push into the platform using our APIs or connectors. So let's say you have a Salesforce running like you do. You can connect it to our platform so you extend the understanding you have of all these profiles on chains for the ones you have data for. Leveraging this, you can then create segments around habits of spending and, and current holdings and past holdings and volume of trading and, and interest and anything. You can create groups of audiences to cover, as Samir said earlier, acquisition, conversion, retention, the whole spectrum of marketing. And in each of these audiences is, of course, a set of profiles. Every single address out there is fully detailed in terms of their full picture profile. And this is a CRM side of things. You can see your data, the data we provide. You can see the ways you have to reach these people. For instance, if you've synchronized an email or a phone number, you can leverage that in your marketing from the platform. And that's the last feature. That's the marketing automation. So think of a HubSpot. Uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud or Marketo, you can automate or Braze, you can automate marketing campaigns starting from Web 2 and Web 3 signals and leveraging Web 2 and Web 3 channels. So you can pick up any transaction happening on the, on the blockchain in real time and react to this by sending a message, maybe rewarding the, the performer of that transaction with an airdrop of a reward badge. You can automate many, many use cases here. And it really depends on your the type of company you are. A lot of gaming companies are very interested in using the platform for rewarding users being active in-game or for minting special wearables during a specific period. Maybe around Christmas, you want to be able to offer a Christmas wearable to anyone who mints one of your key collections in your marketplace. Whatever you want to automate, you can track actions combining Web 2 and Web 3 signals and the rich data to do on-chain messaging, on-chain airdrops and traditional messaging, plus maybe even leverage your existing stack and branch out into Marketo or HubSpot to continue doing your traditional marketing from there. It sounds amazing. I talk to a lot of founders in all aspects of the crypto ecosystem. I think they're all looking for a solution along the lines of what you described. One of the biggest challenges that they run into, though, is it's possible to know a wallet address, but you don't have an email address or a mobile number or a mailing address. Like, how do you actually contact that person? And I, it seems like right now the state of the art is an airdrop, which feels like a fairly kludgy, inefficient way to interact with people. Like thoughts on that? And like, is there a better path? Are you doing something magical here that allows me to connect, connect a wallet address to like other forms of communication that are a little bit more either interactive or real time or, or just useful for outreach and engagement? There's different approaches. Yeah. Mass airdropping is, as you said, 
pointless and and really not recommended the same way you wouldn't you wouldn't do mass emailing or any right. mass marketing right because whatever marketing you do you want it to be relevant timely and targeted so even if you think like nfts could be a way of doing marketing this way if you select an audience that is very relevant to you and you want to make them make available a set of nfts which might have a value over time and you put together a page for them to come and claim and so you target your users leveraging the whole set of data that the blockchain offers through our platforms you create a, a group of maybe crypto millionaires interested in luxury who also happen to hold some key assets that you think are similar to yours and you can start doing a campaign of just teasing what's coming up and, and getting people to come leave an email and claim a nice proof of attendance or a similar nft and so you do some you get some visibility you get your name out there and you also collect email addresses and that's the way any company goes about expanding their knowledge for traditional communication so web3 offers different additional channels airdropping is one but it shouldn't just be let's do an airdrop and that's it it's part of a longer strategy and you know this as a marketer there is also wallet to wallet messaging which is interesting but very early still with great partners which we're working with such as xmtp and push.org uh, which are working on allowing people to send messages to just a wallet address there's challenges around the user experience to this and where do you go to actually read your messages but our vision to this is really allowing our customers to leverage all these different technologies from their marketing hub which we are building here and that leads to your earlier question of how do we integrate with analysis which is we have some overlap in our customer base and so if you look at all the luxury brands and the retailers and the let's say the web 2 brands as we said before they are very cautious when it comes to what they do in the crypto world because of all people can hear about that world and also because that that's a fact there are bad actors out there and you want to make sure that as a company you don't get exposed to this and so one of the offerings that analysis has is scanning addresses and making sure these addresses are not exposed to anything bad from money laundering to scams to whatever else is illegal right so the way we cooperate and work together with analysis is by allowing our customers to scan addresses using your services whenever they are about to communicate with them or whenever they create a, an audience that's going to be eligible for an allow list or which is going to be claiming some key asset. They can first scan these addresses using your services directly from our platform and then ensure that whatever, whatever they do next is vetted and, and safe thanks to you to analysis. It's an awesome integration. We, um, it's our fastest growing product actually, because there's so many people that are not strictly regulated financial entities, right? They're not a crypto exchange or a bank or a payment processor. And so they operate in kind of this gray area of like, hey, I don't really have a true compliance obligation. I'm not a money servicer business or, or one of these financial institutions. However, there is very much the opportunity to run into a sanctioned entity or criminal funds or like, like it's just, it abounds in the crypto ecosystem. And so the ability to trivially integrate via API or on-chain Oracle, this mechanism to just do a quick screen and validation, it takes that concern off the table, which is a really nice experience, I think, for everybody that's kind of newly coming into crypto. Samir, maybe be a tough question for you, but you're obviously originally from France. You now live in the US, but originally from France. And I'm curious, big picture from a European market to the US market, adoption for both your products and kind of Web3 generally, but then also specifically GDPR, which anybody who's a marketer listening to this is probably the biggest challenge that I think marketers have had to overcome in, in the last decade, which I'm personally a fan of. I get annoyed by getting spam messages. I love the idea that I can cause a company I don't really want to interact with to, to delete my presence from the, their database. But it's put a lot of complexity into the, the marketing process, I think, for companies around the world. How does something like GDPR play into how you're thinking about Web3? Like I picked up on Anthony saying a moment ago, hey, there's 425 million addresses that we collect and store in the product and bring to our customers. I have to imagine there's a few people out in the crypto world who maybe aren't super happy about that. What are your thoughts? All of this is anonymized. All of this is public data, cookies, privacy, 
where one of the two main things here that are actually making these Web2 marketing tools obsolete, right? And we have many customers that are telling us, hey, we entering a world without cookies here. We're not seeing your WRM platform as a wallet relationship management. You guys cover email, SMS, push, etc., Discord, Twitter with your platform. They're commodities today, you know, these channels, right? And so we would replace maybe one day our existing Web2 marketing stack with your platform, right? That's what we started to hear. Honestly, we were not expecting that. What is happening is GDPR is about protecting, you know, privacy. And as you said before, you know, privacy and, you know, being anonymized is two different things. We we both French with Anthony. We, we left France eight, nine years ago when actually Mark Benioff invested in our previous company. And I came to San Francisco. Anthony chose Montreal. We actually have been, since the very beginning, very sensitive to privacy, right? And we used what we call design principles, right? before, you know, even GDPR, because we were handling, you know, mobile analytics data here. And we were collaborating with companies like Apple, that is very sensitive on privacy, by the way. For us, it's key. Now, what is interesting with Web3, you don't need to give your name, your birthday, your address or whatever. You anonymized here and customers need to continue on their dApps and websites to follow GDPR principles. On our side, actually, our role is to be able, you know, in a customer profile to allow any customer, any end user, right, to ask one of our customers, brand, clients, right, let's say a, a big brand, to say, I want this data to be removed. But the same way it's working, you know, on Web2 today, it's working on Web3. Our platform is wallet first, right? So it starts with a wallet address. Then you can add an email, a Discord, a Twitter. But it's only with Optin, right? We're not selling data with B2B software. So we're providing the tool for our customers to be able to be the most compliant to GDPR, the California trust, you know, privacy laws as well right here. It's a great place to be in. I, I love the strategy and the approach. Anthony, as we, as we wind down the conversation today, I'm always curious as a product leader, like what's getting you really excited in crypto and Web3? And you can take the answer however you like, either related to what you're building at Absolute or things outside the company, just across the ecosystem. That's a very good question. I like the fact that we're exploring something very new. We are actually creating new things and we're inventing new features. And some of what we're doing yeah. today does not exist anywhere else. We're the pioneers in doing this in Web3. There are other companies doing similar stuff on some aspects of what we do, but in some areas we are just inventing new things. And it's very interesting from a product leader standpoint where I can't really just look at competition and get some inspiration because there is sometimes no competition yet. I can look at Web2, I can look at what the leaders do there and, and look at it from an angle of saying, well, this is old and this can be improved. How can I improve it? But sometimes the context is so different. It's a different paradigm that I can't really just look at what they do. And it's, it's great that we can actually spend time thinking about what else can we do with what we have and given the struggles and the pain points of our customers as well. Of course, that's always the angle we take. We're not building for the beauty of the tech, but we're building so we solve problems for our customers and we open new opportunities for them. And, uh, and that's actually how the company started with Samir. We spent, I remember spending the summer here in Montreal, walking around the city on the phone with Samir and, and brainstorming on how is Web3 going to solve some marketer problems. And we've been in the space for a long time. We've been working with big companies doing marketing on mobile. And so we could relate to, you know, how are these people going to transition and what is it that's going to be complex, but also what is it that's going to be new and, and exciting for them. So I think this is really the part that excites me the most. It's just building new things in an environment where you're just actually the first one trying that. You get to be yes. explorers of a completely new space and domain. The, the rules aren't written. You're not just iterating 10% <laughs> better or something like that. It, it's wholly new. Samir, I'll leave the last word to you. What's got you excited? What are you looking forward to this year in 2023? There's an amazing opportunity here with you know Web2 companies accelerating here and Web3 companies consolidating and you know waking up on their, hey, we need marketing. We need a marketing stack. We need to accelerate. We need to get closer to customers. This is a perfect time for a company like ours, right? And there are two different type of companies, right? But still, you know, very interesting for us. This year is strategic for us. We want to get close to 100 customers by the end of the year and it's going quite fast. Fortunately, our experience with Anthony and the team has been 
in the past building, you know, large teams across different continents. What is interesting in Web3 as well is it's not just the US, but it's also Europe. It's also Asia. Uh, we already, already have teams now in, in Europe, in Paris, and very soon actually in Asia as well, probably in Southeast Asia. Things are looking great. We, you know, we're not seeing any uh, recession in our market. It's quite the opposite. Again, you know, recession time, companies need to better compete, better serve their customers, get, you know, more closer to them. And that's where, you know, we're probably more a solution here to their challenge and problems. Amazing. I love the optimistic outlook. We need more of that these days. Thank you, Samir, Anthony. This has been a great conversation. I appreciate you joining us on Public Key. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for listening to another episode of Public Key. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and our newly launched TikTok channel, where we share our favorite moments captured in this podcast and other great content from the Chainalysis team. And if you're into crypto policy and financial compliance, I know you'll enjoy our new YouTube show, Know Your Crypto Compliance, hosted by my colleague, Caitlin Barnett. One other topic before we go, if you haven't paid close attention, the Solana blockchain has several uniquely sophisticated features, including the ability to transfer ownership of an address that holds other tokens. This makes blockchain analysis complex and can easily lead to incorrect assumptions about ownership history. Fortunately, the team at Chainalysis has you covered. They've built a robust knowledge graph of the Solana chain in order to make analysis intuitive and trustworthy. If you're interested to go deeper into this engine engineering challenge, we've shared the details on our blog. As always, the link can be found in the show notes.